Thank you for choosing to listen to our Faith Family Church podcast. For more information about our church and who we are, you can visit our website at ffcacworth.com. Thank you so much again for listening. Praise the Lord. I want you to go to Genesis this morning, the 12th chapter. Genesis, the 12th chapter. This morning, we've been talking about the blessed life. And I want to continue this. We've got a couple more weeks that I want to continue on in this process. Um, um, so please, if you would, be mindful of it. Be ready to receive the Lord. Um, how many know that the blessed life is for you today? Amen. Amen. That's what we're going to talk about. It is for you today. We have, I was raised in a time in the church where a lot of good things happened. I mean, I got saved, filled the Holy Ghost and power. God moved in mighty ways, okay? And I, here's, here's my fear of the past is I don't want my past bigger than my future. Amen. And so if your, fa- if your past, if all you can do is remember what God used to do, then there's a problem. There's a problem in you. Let me just say that to you. There's a problem in you, not with God. God's not changed. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And, and you're saying, well, maybe it's in the church. Well, it, it could be a part of the church, too. Don't um, get me wrong. The problem can be within the church as well as within you, but I need you to look first within you. I've, I've understood that revival. If revival is not happening in my church, probably because it's not happening in me. Amen? And we always want to look to see somebody else and to find somebody else's reason as to why my life isn't being blessed, okay? And then I'm not walking in the blessings of God. But I've learned through the years that I can't depend on the assemblies of God or any other church or any organization or any other preacher or any individual. I can only depend on my personal relationship with God. And if I have no personal relationship with God, then I'll have no blessings with God. Amen? And you'll not walk and live in blessings this morning. Hallelujah. For some reason, this thing is not coming up, and that's all right. If it does, it doesn't. We're going to still go on. The 12th chapter, initiation of a covenant. This is the initiation of the first covenant. There's five covenants, and that's probably where I'll go next. I've been asking God to give me insight as to where he wants me to go in our messages and our services, and I believe probably where I'll go next is talking about the five different covenants that we find in the Word of God. Um, uh, There's five covenants that God initiated this first one. Of course, God initiated all of them, amen? But this first one is the Abrahamic covenant that he wrought with Abraham. Verse 1, let's look, 12 verse 1. Let's stand for the reading of God's Word, and then I'll let you be seated. The stand for the reading of God's word, the blessed life. Now the Lord said to Abraham, or Abram, this is before he renamed him Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from your father's house, to land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation, and I will bless you, and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing... Notice this, you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you, and I will curse him who curses you. And in you all the families, hear this, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Father, thank you for the reading of your word, and I thank the Lord today for this church, faith family church. We're all about faith in you, faith in growing in you, faith in growing together, and faith in growing your kingdom, Lord. And, Lord, we need desperately to grow your kingdom, Lord, in this house. And, Lord, I just pray, Lord, that you'd help us. But we can't grow a kingdom unless we ourselves are grown enough to give forth. Lord, and I just pray, Lord, that you'd help us individually as well as corporately as a body. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. The blessed life is an interesting one. You may be seated this morning. Tell somebody I'm blessed. Amen. You're blessed today. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The blessed life is a very interesting one in the aspect that God has asked us to live there. He wants us to reside right there. He don't want us to uh, be without. Let me ask you this. As a parent, any parents here today, any parents at all, how many like to see their kids suffer? How many many like to see your children be without? Even though, you know, sometimes (laughs) I was talking with, I, I went and got a haircut yesterday and 
And I was talking to one of the individuals there, and, and uh, he was telling me about all his woes of his personal family and his kids and how some of his kids earned the right <laughs> to be in a mess. Amen? He, I don't care how well he raised them, and I, I believe this dad tried his best, and I don't, you know, I don't know him well enough to, to judge either way, okay? I'm, I'm simply going by watching and talking to the individual and listening to his heart. He, I believe he is a born-again believer. Without question, I believe as a dad through the years, he's done his best. But he's got one child in particular that's run amok in life and just seemingly can't seem to change. And she's been in and out of prison, and she's back in prison again. And it's like she's learning the hard way. And she said, he, he said, you'd think she could learn from others' mistakes. And I said, well, you know, that's interesting you say that because that's what the Bible says, that God said that he don't want us to be like Israel. He don't want us to follow, follow suit with what Israel did and how they, they provoke God to anger and even to the point where God judged and brought judgment upon them. But he wanted to bless them. He wants us to reside in blessing. And it's quite interesting. When God delivered Israel out of Egypt, he fully intended to bless them. He fully intended for them to walk in a place of blessing, live in a place of blessing, dwell in a place of blessing. He did not intend for them to die in the wilderness. He does not intend, and you need to say this to yourself every day, God does not intend for me to die in the wilderness of this life. God does, he's got a promised land, and I know it's heaven, and I know it's eternity, but I believe that, again, his will can be performed here on this earth before we make heaven our home. And he wants you to walk in blessings. Now, it's not always about financial things, but it is a part of financial blessings as well. God doesn't want you to be without. God does not want you to be without. He doesn't want you to struggle in finances. You know, any time that I've ever personally struggled with my finances is because of me or my wife, but it wasn't because of God. There was never a time, and I... And I even in the good times when business was well and things were really well in my business and everything was just going, it was God, okay? And when everything fell out and come all apart and everything else, I had to look like it wasn't the economy of the United States of America or the economy of the world. It was the economy of Donald's own foolish heart that I lost sight of who God was in my life and I began to become my own source of strength and I began to become my own source a provision. And when you lose sight of who God is, then you'll go through some suffering. Amen? And I'm, I'm encouraging you this morning, this blessed life, you know, because part of what we were talking about, we were, these were the points we were looking at. What is the blessed life? Is it better to live in blessings and miracles? We know that God doesn't want you to always have to believe for miracles. He don't want you to have to believe for miracles for your car to start or your car to run or your car to keep going. He wants you to just trust him that when your car breaks down, you have enough money to have it fixed in the name of Jesus. You won't need a miracle every time something catastrophic happens in your life because God has provision for your life, and that's where God would rather you live. And I'll be honest with you, that's where I'd rather live. I've lived long enough with struggling, how am I going to pay the bills, and how am I going to make my car payment, and how am I going to do this, how am I going to do that? And I'm tired of having to believe for miracles. God would rather you just walk in blessings. That's the story of Saul, King Saul, and King David. The difference was King Saul was saving up for what? A rainy day. He was going to save up to make sacrifices unto God. God said, look, I don't need you to always come and repent and sacrifice. I just need you to obey. And if you obey, then I'll give you blessings that you cannot contain and you'll have always more than enough. And see, that's our struggle, though. We get in trouble, so then we got to believe for a miracle. So we went through that, and I want you to understand it's better to live in blessings than always have to believe for miracles. But if you got to believe for miracles, then do it in the name of God, in the name of Jesus, because he's more than able to produce a miracle. He did it for 40 years in Israel with the people of Israel, and they can surely do it for you. The, the third thought this morning as we want to talk about is, is blessed life for me today? And yes, it is. And we're going to talk in reference to the fact that it's a calling. It's a calling. Go, again, Genesis, the 12th chapter. Now go to Galatians, the third chapter with me. We've read, now please understand, I want to say, show something to you about this covenant. Not only is this a covenant, okay, 
but this is a promise. Now, there's something about every covenant that God wrought with his people, he brings a promise. And the promise is unconditional in this aspect. Because often we understand that we know that the word of God is conditional in many ways. But in this case, this was unconditional. God said, I will. I just want to pause there for just a moment. When he brought this covenant to Abraham or Abram at the time, when he brought it to Abram, the bottom line is it was not only a covenant, but I promise you, let me say this, God promises you, God promises us, that I will. Every promise in my book, what did he say? Every promise that I've made to you is what to you? Yes. What does that mean? Then I will, Brother Mike, won't he? He will. I will. All I've got to do is trust him. All I've got Galatians 3rd chapter, verse 8. Let's go there. Now this 3rd chapter of Galatians, you need to read it. You need to meditate on this 3rd chapter because it's all about that covenant and how that covenant has been wrought. In verse 29, he says, that if we are, and if you are in Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heir according to the promise. Notice he said promise here, promise meaning covenant, okay? And, and there's plenty of scripture, but I want you to look at the eighth verse. For the scriptures foreseeing that God would justify the nations by faith, preach the gospel to Abraham beforehand saying, in you all the nations shall be blessed. So God makes a promise to Abraham that's not changed, even through the blood of Christ. And what was the promise? That Christ would someday come, that he would die on a cross, and that he would break all the powers of hell, death, and the grave over my life. Everything. He didn't just, he didn't just remove it again. He destroyed it, okay? And so I understand that. But see, here's, here's our struggle. We understand, but for some reason we're not walking there. You're saying, what do you mean, Pastor? I'm walking there. Are you really? Are you seeing the miracles that God promised in his word? Are you seeing the results that God promised in your word? What is your life like? What are your children's life like? What is your family life like? Do you really, when, when you come to church, are you, do you look just like you do at home? And when you at home, do you look just like you do at church? Do you find yourself at home worshiping God and praising God? Do you find yourself at home, do you find yourself on the street corner trusting God just like you trust him in church? Or is there somewhat a double standard within us? Is there somewhat, you know, we speak and believe one thing and we only speak at one time and then we go away. Now, hear my heart. Here, here's, the, here's the biggest battle that I think majority of the church world's having today is they don't stay with it because it's not really what's in their heart. And I hope you hear what I'm saying this morning because this is a real important part that I've been trying to ask God. Give me insight as to how to convey this. We say things that are not really in our heart. We pray things for divine healing, divine deliverances. But then we go do everything contrary to what the word says to do. And it's quite interesting that we put a lot of hope and faith in natural things, in natural substance, even to the point where we put more hope and trust in it than we do the Word, because the Word said to have daily bread with Him, to daily walk with Him and daily meditate. The Word said to Joshua and to many others. He said to Abraham, He said to Isaac, He said to David, He said to all of us in New Testament, he said for us to meditate both day and night upon his word. He said for us never to stop speaking his word. And he said for us never to stop doing his word. Now let me ask you something. If you've got a sickness and you go to the doctor and you get an antidote from the doctor, which is nothing wrong with that, go do it if you need to. That's fine. And you get medicine. And on that medicine bottle, <laughs> the medicine bottle says take three tablets three times a day for two weeks. What are you going to do? You're supposed to take three tablets. Now what happens if you don't take three tablets every day for two weeks? Well, I do it for one day, two days. Third day, well, you know, I don't feel any different. Oh, well. 
or you forget about it. You go on because you're busy. Two weeks later, you go back to the doctor and say, you can have the stinking medicine. I don't want it. It don't work. He's saying to you, why do you still have medicine? You were supposed to take it all within two weeks. We do this with God, and we don't even realize it. We get busy about our lives, so busy that we don't take God's word daily. We don't meditate on him daily. Our minds are not renewed truly to his word. We pray things that are good and accurate and right. It's not the, 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 the indiscrepancy of my prayer. It's where my heart really is, is the problem. It's where I really am because if, if my heart was really into it, then I would have done it three times a day for two weeks, no matter what, I would have done it. If my heart's really in it for the rest of my life, every day when I get up, I present myself anew and afresh to God. You know what? You know what happened to your preacher this morning? Yesterday, in my studies, I was going through my message, and I was really into the Lord, and all of a sudden I get a phone call. I should have known better, but I answered the phone call because I just did. I don't know. And they fixed my boat. I put my boat in the shop because it was having some problems. So they fixed my boat. And man, you know how hard it was for me to get my mind off my boat after he said, I was in the presence of God Almighty, having a great time with the Lord. I mean, it was so wonderful, that, that moment with God. And then I get interrupted, and then for the next 30, 40 minutes, an hour, I'm fighting, getting my mind off my boat. I want to go to the lake. I want to ride in the boat. I want to lay in the water. I want, I want to play. Amen, yeah, amen, brother. <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that, John. There isn't wrong with that. But here's the problem. Where's your heart? Where truly is your heart? We want the miracles with healing. We want the miracles of deliverance. We want the victories in our lives. But where really is my heart? Is my mind really renewed? You know what I woke up this morning? I didn't wake up thinking about souls being saved. I actually woke up thinking about my boat again. Where's my heart? There's souls dying and going to hell. They're in need of your message. The relationship I have with God, the relationship you have with God, they're in need of that. They're in need of knowing what it is to be blessed of God. Knowing what it is to want. I got saved and filled with the Holy Ghost and power and I went home that night, couldn't stop speaking in tongues because the Spirit of God was all about me. For hours and hours I laid in bed as a kid just praising God. I couldn't stop. And I got to thinking, God, is that bigger to me? Do I remember that in a bigger way, in a more fascinating way than I do even today? After 50 years of being with you, God. Come on, church, where's your heart? Where's my heart? See, we, we want the blessed life, and it's for us. God didn't say to us that he's going to make you the lender and not the borrower. He didn't say to you that I'm going to bless you to overcome it. He didn't say to you that your, 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 your uh, baskets will overflow and your coverage will never go without. And, and he didn't say to you that you'd have always more than enough just because it was something good to say. He didn't promise this promise and this covenant to Abraham not to fulfill because God said, I will. And if he says, I will, then he shall do it. God cannot do anything that he does not will to do. If he wills it, it's yours. It's, it's done. Even if Abraham wouldn't have been faithful, which Abraham at times wasn't, God was still faithful. And God has a word that cannot change. And when heaven and earth pass away and everything is gone and we don't know anything as what it was and we see it as today, God's word shall still be. So where, in a, where do I need to be? I need to be renewed to this word. I know it sounds so repetitive, and, and I can't seem to get it. Maybe, maybe I'm preaching this all because pastor's not there yet. <laughs> Thank you, Brother Mike. Because that's the only way I know to get their faith comes by hearing the word. I must hear it every day. You must get up every morning and take this word like medicine to your soul because it is. And you must bask in it, and you must speak it. And you Look, you cannot have what God said you can have unless you do it the way he said you need to do it. Amen? And it just goes to show you, I wonder how far our hearts are really from God. I wonder how many of us were thinking about our boats and our 
jobs and our house and our job, you know. God help us, you know, I, we want, and I, and I want, I, we're doing a lot of improvements around here, and thank God we have the money to do it, and don't worry, we're not going in debt, and don't worry, I'm not going to burn out and exhaust us to the point, but we're going to keep doing changes, because we need to modernize some things and clean up some things around here, especially in our children's department. Our children need the best, because the world's giving them the best. The world's giving them the best, boy. I mean, the world's giving them every kind of gadget and gizmo they can get, Amen. And folks, it's not that I'm competing against the world. The greatest thing I can give them is the anointing of God. But in the process, they need to come to something that's pleasing to the eyes so in turn we can get to their heart. Amen? And I don't know any other way. But so I'm looking at that. But all this, it's all in vain. I don't don't care how pretty a building you have. If there's no anointing, if there's no word, if there's no spirit of God, it's, it's in vain. So my push to you is that we take the word. That if I could, again, I, I said this at our men's, um, in our men's message uh, months ago when it was Father's Day. Guys, if I could brainwash you with anything, I would hide this word so deep within your mind that it couldn't do nothing but get into your heart and transform it. If I could brainwash you, it'd be the word. God initiated this covenant. It is unconditional, depending solely upon who God's obligated himself in grace, indicating by unconditional declaration, here it is, God said to Abraham, I will. Before he knew what, and and I know this, God knew the heart of Abram, and he knew the heart of Abraham, and he knew where Abraham would ultimately end, don't get me wrong. But I believe that's why God was able to come to Abraham and declare, Abraham, I will, because I know what you're going to do, boy. And I believe that, I want, to, I, want to, I want to believe with all my heart that God's looking down at Donald Saglebun and he's saying, Donald, I will because I know your heart, son. I know your heart's going to be my heart. I know that you're going to keep your heart with mine. So I will through your life do what I said I would do. And I can't help but go back. And I don't want to go back to make my past bigger than my future. But the bottom line is God gave me a promise. God gave me promises even when I was a young boy, 13 and a half years old. And I'm telling you, I'm still looking for some of those. I'm still looking for some of those things to manifest through and in my life. And I'm not going to stop because this is the only way through his word. Amen. We go on. The blessed life is a calling. It's a blessing of calling. And here's how the calling responds. When it was a national calling, what does he say here? He said, um, I, he said in verse 2, I will make you a great nation. It's national in the fact that he's going to make a great nation. It's personal. And he said, I will bless you and make your name great. Amen. It's universal in the fact that all the families of the world are going to be blessed through you, Abraham, through you. I'm going to work. Through Faith Family Church. Could, you, could, could we put ourselves there, church? Could we put ourselves really there and realize that God wants to bless the nations? He wants to bless us personally that we, our name would be great, that Faith Families Church would be great in, in regards to that. It's a place where the presence of God is moving. Amen. Amen. It's not great in the fact that, wow, look at that big building they have and look at all the awesome things they're doing. No, it's about what God is doing in us. And universally, can we literally bless the nations? We're doing that by faith through our missionaries and others. Amen. Separate call. Uh, or I mean, what is the call? Uh, the call involves this, a separation. I want to go here with me a little bit. Go to 2 Corinthians. Go to 2 Corinthians this morning. I want, I want to emphasize something because I heard this the other day. Somebody quoted this very passive scripture, and it kind of bothered me in the way they were using it. And the only reason why it did is because they were looking for an excuse not to have to be around people of this world, sinful people of this world, because the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, let's read it. 2 Corinthians, the 6th chapter, verse 14. I want to start there. Do not, uh, do not be unequally yoked. And please underscore that, that word, that, that unequally yoked is so important. I, I want to explain this to you, why I'm saying this. That is... We often overlook this and what he's trying to say to us here. Do not be unequally yoked together 
with unbelievers. Now, what I'm going to say to you is don't be in covenant with unbelievers. Don't be in covenant with unbelievers. My son-in-law was um, starting a business, and I talked to him in private about it, and I said, son, I know you, you've got a partner coming in with you. And I want to read the scripture to you, son, because it's important to me. You're important to me. You're my, uh, the husband of my daughter, and you're the father to my grandchildren. And I want, this is important to me. So I, I read this to him. I said, do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. The guy you're going into business with, is he a believer or not? Does he know Jesus like you know him? Does he believe like you believe? I said, if he doesn't, Brian, then don't, don't enter in. Don't enter into that covenant. Because you're going to rot a covenant with him that you're not going to win. You're going to lose. There's going to be discrepancies. There's going to be conflict. You will not be successful. You might have some success, but you won't ultimate end be successful like God wants you to be. You cannot be unequally yoked in marriage. You cannot be unequally yoked in business. You cannot equally be yoked with those and what I mean by that is that doesn't mean that I can't have friends that are unsaved. In fact, I encourage you to have as many unsaved friends as possible so you can have an impact on their life instead of them having an impact on yours. Amen? And, and, and this is what it talks about. He said this, he goes on further. He said, don't be unequally yoked for what fellowship has righteousness with law, lawlessness and what communion was light with darkness or what accord with Christ and Beile or, or the devil himself, or what part has a believer with an unbeliever? Now, please hear my heart. We often take this as that we're supposed to come out from among this world and, and be separate and, not and touch not the unclean thing. That means every sinner out there, I'm never going to touch them. I'm never going to have... And the church, I'll tell you what, years ago, in fact, Sister Rose and I had a conversation with her not long ago. She was talking about how she was raised and and I was raised that way as a child. Let me say this. I was raised that way to stay out of the world and come out of the world because I was a young child. The key was I was a child and daddy and mama were doing right. Get me out of that environment that can destroy me. But when I became a man, I was able to put away the childish things. And now I'm mature enough to stand in the midst of any storm and by faith I should be able to go out into this world now and disciple and make disciples and win souls and be that light in a dark place. But see, too many times the church, we came into our own little bubble and we got in this little church and we stayed in this little church and oh, the Spirit of God moved in this church and the anointing of God fell and I was blessed and I was touched by God and I was healed and delivered. But I never took any of that to the world that needed it. There's nothing wrong with us being blessed and coming out from this world, and especially in a church. Man, there should be the holiness and righteousness of living in our lives. But when we get that, we're supposed to take it out into all the world. Go ye into the world. Go ye into the world. What was it? Jesus, he never separated himself from the sinner. He separated himself from their sin, but he never separated himself from them. I don't need to be in their sins with them. But I need to be with them while they're in their sin. So I can help them come to a place of understanding like I came. When light from darkness, I, I, I went to light and, and my life was transformed. And we often preach this word, come out and stay away from the church and don't let the, the world come into the church. I hope the world comes into this church. I hope that every sinner... And Akron, Georgia will someday come through these doors. I hope that when they come through, they'll find transformation. I pray that everybody, we open this door. Let's not be afraid of how they come in. Let's only be concerned of how they go out. <laughs> Let them go out with a renewed spirit and a transformed life. Amen. Hallelujah. Boy, you guys are quiet today. You're quiet. Help me, Lord. I don't know if I'm missing or not. I hope not. What accompanies this call? The promise of possession. What accompanied the call of Abraham, the promises of Abraham? It was a promise I will, you will possess a land. Someday I'll make heaven my home. I will possess that land. But until then, I want to be found faithful, God. 
Someday I'm going to possess that land. I, I have a promised land yet to come. I'm not of this world, amen? The promise of being ble a blessing. See, here's, here's what we often forsake, the part of being a blessing. Are you blessing those that are around you? Are you blessing those that despitefully use you? Are you praying for those that despitefully use you? Are you blessing them in a way that they can only see Christ and not you? Uh, let me bring it to a close here this morning. A company of the call is the blessings. And how the call was received in Abraham, how this life of blessing was received in Abraham, he had an unwavering faith. Go to Matthew. Let's look at this this morning. Matthew 21, 21. Matthew 21, 21 this morning. What does he say? So Jesus answered and said to them, Assuredly I say to you, if you have faith and do not doubt, you will not only do what was done to the fig tree, but, you, but also if you say to the mountain, be removed and be cast into the sea, it will be done. All things, whatsoever you ask in prayer, believing, you will receive. Is it really hard to understand that one? Just as Jesus cursed the fig tree and walked away and come back and it was withered a day later, here he said the same can be for you in your life. The problem is, I'll just be honest with you, the disciples didn't believe. When, they, when Jesus spoke that tree because the manifestation didn't take place right there and then, they failed to believe. That's why they were surprised the next day. And we do that often because we didn't see the manifestation today. We walk away and think, well, it didn't occur. There it goes again. God's word's not working. Nah, that ain't the case. Remain in faith whether you see it or not. I didn't walk. The Bible says not, don't, not to walk by sight, but by what? By faith. I'm not given by what I see in the natural. That's the problem, though. Again, we let the natural rule overrule the, nat the spirit. Enduring faith. He had an unwavering faith in God's word and an enduring faith. In other words, he endured. Go with me to Philippians, the third chapter. I'm going to close with this this morning. Philippians, the third chapter. Verse 12. Not that I've already obtained or I'm already perfect, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Aren't you glad that he's got a hold of you this morning? Verse 13, Brethren, I do not count myself as apprehended, but one thing I do not forget, uh, I do, forgetting those things which are behind me and reaching forward to those things which are ahead. I press toward the goal of the prize of the upward calling of God in Christ Jesus. Now there's a constant reaching for more. What's work and is working in my life, provision in my life and victories in my life of all kinds are only because of the blessings of God. I walk in his blessings only because what? I burn, I've allowed myself to renew my thinking to his word. And I take every thought captive at instant to the obedience of his word. I understand that his word works. And so I must stay right there. Even if I don't see it happen instantaneously, even though I don't see the fig tree fail today, even if I don't see the mountain get up and be cast into the sea today, I'm not going to stop speaking to that mountain until I see it done because that's what God's word said to do. And I renew my mind to that continuously. Whatever the mountain is in your life, I'm telling you, if you got kids that are wayward, speak over their life, life instead of death. Begin to speak to that mountain and say, I call them back in the name of Jesus. They'll not be lost in this world, but that God, they'll be renewed to your word. Come on, and, and there's many other things in your life. If you've got sickness that's trying to prevail in your home in the name of Jesus, God didn't just write the word that says that by my 
his stripes you are healed because it was something good to say to you. He said it because he meant it and he said, I will perform it in your life and by faith you stand there. I will, I will, I will. My promises are will to you. Yes and amen. Come on, church. I know life is hard. I know you're tired. Some of you have been in this church for many, many years, and all I can say to you is God said he will. He will. And by faith, he has already. Come on, keep speaking of this mountain with me. We got a mountain that we're, we're trying to possess. It's called Ackworth, Georgia. There's thousands and thousands. I told you, over 50% of Cherokee County right now is unchurched. Over 50%. You th and, and look, we got some mega churches like we, we have the mega Baptist church down here, probably 10, 20,000 people in their church. I don't know what Brother Johnny has over there. You know, but even in that big mega church, there's still 50% of Cherokee County that doesn't go to church. And that means probably if they don't go to church, most likely they're not even born again. Then I wonder how many of that do go to our churches and aren't born again either. You ever watch that movie, and I'm going to close with this thought, but you ever watch the movie, The Titans, the football movie? Anybody ever watch that movie? One of the things that Denzel Washington says in that movie that has always kind of struck me is that he, he makes it a point to drive home that I'm the same with every boy on my team. I'm, I'm the same with you know, I, I, I treat him all the same, whether he's white or black. I treat him the same. Now, that, that's a powerful movie. There's all kinds of cool things to watch in that movie. The thing that just seemed to resonate me when he made that statement, I treat him all the same. God treats us all the same. And what he's willed for me, he's willed for you. I will it for you. He won't force your hand. He wills it for you. That's the conditional part that I didn't talk about. The unconditional part is he said, I will. That all men come to the saving knowledge of Christ. I willed that. And now what are they going to do with my will? Are they going to say, not mine, but thine be done? Or not? Father, please help us as we bow for a moment of prayer. There are people in here on every level, God, and Holy Spirit, I need you to do for them what I can't do. Please touch them where they're at. God, for the soul that's young in the Lord and doesn't fully understand, enlighten him. Enlighten her. Let him see through your eyes today. For the souls that have been with you for years that are struggling, God, let them see through your eyes today. Thank you for choosing to listen to our Faith Family Church podcast. For more information about our church and who we are, you can visit our website at ffcackworth.com. Thank you so much again for listening.